For you four, it's half past six, and now here's Clive Jacobs with a special edition of Going Places, celebrating a special anniversary. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Tony Yule, and I'll be flying you across the pond today, and on behalf of the entire crew, welcome to Concord. In Toulouse, 20 years ago this month, Concorde 001 took off for the first time. A few weeks later, 002 flew from Filton in Bristol. And the aircraft that's created so many aviation records will tomorrow take off on another. The start of the first supersonic round-the-world trip. Price, £23,200 a head. It's different and quite exciting. That's largely because we use full power and in addition to that, we use our engines with reheat, or the American terminology, afterburner. Very simply, we have a facility for injecting fuel into the jet pipes, which gives us some 20% extra thrust. Now, we use that extra thrust to accelerate the slender Delta aircraft to her takeoff speed of 249 miles an hour. Give one clear for takeoff, Roger. E two, one, now. One hundred knots. So the world's only supersonic airliner, once seemingly doomed and now booming in more than one sense, sets off on yet another routine flight to New York. Climbing to 28,000 feet and close to the speed of sound by the time it flies over its English birthplace, where on April the 9th, 1969, Test pilot Brian Trubshaw held his breath, pushed the throttles forward and waited for the magic 249 miles an hour. Looking more like a bird of prey, Concorde 002 screamed into the Bristol skies. The eagle had taken off. Things are a little different today. When we taxied out, of course, it was rather unknown of how things were going to work out. We had got a simulator which we'd used, and uh, so we had some idea of the flight characteristics of Concord, and of course it was a big uh, moment for us 20 years ago to think of the first aeroplane lining up like this, and I think it would be fair to say we were perhaps a little dry in the mouth at this particular moment on our first flight. It was a year and a half before Concord was to do what is now taken as routine, go Sonic and seven years before its first commercial transatlantic flight, London-Washington. A man who was then running a car rental company in the US, but was later to have more than a close acquaintance with Concorde, was booked on only the second flight from Washington. Colin Marshall, now knighted and now British Airways chief executive. And I suppose the lasting memory that I have of that flight, other than the obvious uh, impression of getting across the Atlantic so quickly, was the elderly French lady who was sitting next to me and it was her first flight ever and when we finished uh, eating the very nice meal she opened her in-flight bag and swept everything off the tray into the bag and she then asked me if uh, I wanted mine and I said no and she then took my tray and swept everything into her bag as well. For the purposes of uh aircraft uh, avoidance and good visibility the visor section which streamlines the nose is lowered into the nose section and the nose can be lowered to two positions uh, one at five degrees and one at 12 degrees the 12 degree position is used for landing contrary to popular opinion the pilots don't go up and down but in fact it is hinged below the pilot seats and quite simply that any time we operate the aircraft below about 310 miles an hour, the visor is down with the nose at 5 degrees. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're now uh, some 300 miles to the southwest of Ireland, at 51,000 feet and cruising at Mach 2. Uh, Mach 2 is twice the speed of sound, or put very simply today, it is 22 miles a minute, roughly one mile every three seconds. Now, once we start to increase speed from about Mach 1.85, the temperature rise across the aeroplane is quite marked. And at the moment, we have a temperature on the nose of the aeroplane of 125 degrees centigrade, and the maximum being 127 degrees. This heat is spread generally fairly evenly throughout the aeroplane, 
and as a result the metal does expand and overall the aeroplane expands somewhere between 8 and 10 inches and the structure is so designed that the aircraft can expand quite happily and the passengers don't know anything about it. In fact, some wag tried to sell the space, you know, but uh, I don't think anybody really bought that idea. Although there were plans to build 300 or so Concords and the Americans wanted a supersonic airliner of their own, in fact, selling space was to prove to be an achievement almost equal to designing and building the aircraft. The euphoria of supersonic commercial flight was shot down not least by the oil crisis, but also by fears over the effect on the environment. New Yorkers refused point-blank to allow Concorde in. There was great concern in Britain too. With so many supersonic airliners on the horizon, what effect would hundreds of sonic booms have on populations? And there was worry about what damage the aircraft might do to the ozone layer. Although later it was to prove deodorants did the damage, not Concorde, the aircraft became a sight as familiar in New York as the Statue of Liberty, and hearing a sonic boom about as unusual for most as flying Concorde itself, those initial concerns were sufficiently severe to clip its wings. The US supersonic plans were scrapped, and instead of hundreds of Concords, there were to be but 16. British Airways and Air France bought seven apiece. But the voice of protest wasn't satisfied. There was another major consideration. What happened in the end was that a huge sum of money was invested. Inflation makes the sums look less than they uh, were at the time because it really was a colossal slice of our resources, not just money, but the very best skills in the aircraft industry went into that. This is Andrew Wilson, author of The Concorde Fiasco. And they did so at a cost to other projects. If we had been putting the money that we put into Concorde, into example, things like the European Airbus, then we would have been making a real contribution to world air transport and at the same time benefiting the economy. And of course, in the end, the sums which were invested to develop the aircraft on the R&D had to be written off. From the airline standpoint, of course, uh, we paid the uh, originally agreed upon price for the Concords that came into our fleet. Uh, it is correct that uh, the government subsequently approved the airline uh, writing off the original cost of Concorde in its balance sheet, but the airline was in fact never compensated uh, by the government. It didn't actually receive money from the government uh, for writing it off uh, in the balance sheet. And I would have to say that uh, had it not been written off, we uh, would be operating Concorde today and would have been so doing for the past several years at an overall profit. Sir Colin agrees that the change from loss to profit came in 1982 with the formation within British Airways of a special division to promote Concorde and the charter market that that created. In that year alone, Concorde revenue amounted to £14 million. That really was the turning point uh, at which it started to move from being a perceived lame duck to becoming the golden goose of today. Those who run and operated at British Airways have an affection, a pride, even a dedication to Concorde many family members might be jealous of. For instance, Jock Lowe, General Manager, Operations Control, won't put up with criticism even when it comes from the Chief Executive. I still question whether it ever really was a lame duck. Um, it was, it's the most beautiful piece of machinery you've ever seen and it represents a 40, 50 year step forward in technology. But it did assume the label, I think, of being um, a bit of a loss maker. But after a few years, we realized we could treat it as special, and we had to acknowledge that our passengers wanted to use the great efficiency of the aeroplane. And so it was not a price-sensitive market. And we, we almost had a, a financial perpetual motion machine in that, when we put the fares up to realistic levels, each time we put the fares up, we actually got an increase in volume uh, of passengers travelling with us as well. What's the difference in price between the, the very early, the very first days of Concorde Transatlantic and now? Well, the fare when we first began was well under £1,000. Now it's just under £2,000. Although a trip round the Bay of Biscay may seem a bit in for a dig alongside the kudos of corporate transatlantic flight for top executives, there's no doubt much of the Concorde fleet income is generated in the charter market. Of course, it's by no means all round the bay. Nonetheless, this lot seems very satisfied with exactly that. It's like some, nothing else on earth. It's a fantastic plane. Well, it's something uh, that not many people are able to do. It's a, it's a romance that's been right from the very beginning, when it took off and we saw it coming over home in 1976. 
and, and you never get tired of it. And the noise is even attractive. And, it, and it, there are times when you see it in the evening sky and the sunsets when it takes on a, a, an orange hue and, and it is beautiful. Well, this is my first time on board actually. And I think I rather like it because of the luxury, because of the speed. And because I don't actually like flying very much, but I think I could enjoy flying on this aeroplane. I've been a fan of Concorde since 69. Well, I lived in Cornwall then. And um, it used to create the barriers or make the sounds down the valley over Falmouth. People that I worked with used to come out of the factories and throw their hats in there. There have been many occasions over the last few years where Concorde's arrival has jammed up all of the roads, all of the highways around it. In fact, we did have the experience, uh, I suppose now three years or so ago, when it went into Munich and all of the traffic just came to a halt on the autobahns around Munich airport. And the German authorities uh, said, you must never bring Concorde into Munich again because we cannot <laughs> contend with these traffic jams. And on that flight, going places Tom Boswell. And up on the little hillocks there, little mounds of earth, there's groups of people that over across to the left I can see a large amount of earth covered with people here in the sun out to see Concorde, that British aeroplane coming and land for the first time in Germany. The scene at the side of the airport here is absolutely unbelievable. You would think we'd been loaded up here with every pop star in existence, but Elton John, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, they're not here. It's just the British aircraft, Concorde. An absolutely extraordinary sight here in Germany. Thousands of people right round the perimeter of the airfield. Obviously the advanced publicity has been effective, lots of people here. But it's not just Concorde's appearance that's distinctive, so is its engineering. And the flight crew deal regularly with its idiosyncrasies, like this one, in effect moving the centre of gravity. As we go faster, and certainly supersonically, that centre of pressure will ultimately move back by the time we reach Mach 2, some seven and a half feet. So very simply, we have to balance that uh, centre of pressure moving backwards by moving the centre of gravity. I suppose the easiest way would have been to move all the passengers to the back of the aeroplane, but the cabin crew finds that rather difficult to do the serving. So instead, the aircraft has, in fact, 13 fuel tanks, five in each wing, and three along the centre line of the aeroplane. Two in the forward section, tanks 9 and 10, and one in the rear, tank 11. And basically, as we go faster, we, the flight engineer, and Willie Brown today, will in fact move the fuel from tank 9 through eventually to tank 11 at the rear, moving some 10 tonnes of fuel to be there by the time we're reaching Mach 2. 10 tonnes of fuel is very difficult to imagine, but if you can know the, what a double-decker bus looks like, it's rather like having a double-decker bus sitting at the back end of the aeroplane. Imagine now, though, not nose pressed to a wire fence to catch a glimpse of Concorde, but actually sitting in the pilot's seat on the flight deck. 204 feet of aircraft, over 80 feet of wingspan, and four engines, each capable of producing just over 38,000 pounds of thrust. It was an experience this journalist would have given his right arm for, had it been necessary. So here we are now, um, sitting on the end of runway 31 left at Kennedy Airport, Jamaica Bay on the left-hand side, and the downtown skyline right ahead of us. And now, Clive, what do you reckon? Do you reckon you can get this thing into the air? My golly, it's the chance of a lifetime, isn't it? I shall have an extremely good try, Tony. Okay. Are we ready? We're ready. All right. Three, two, one, now. That's the throttles right forward. There we go, down the centre of the runway. Airspeed's building. Uh, we're going very well. Across the green line of lights. That's V1. Both hands on there. Right. And pull back on the stick. And up comes the nose. Push it there, hold it there at 14 degrees. And we have a positive climb. Thank the sort of <laughs> My golly. We made it, Tony. You we made are now indeed. up in the air over New York. There's the Chrysler building and there's the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. Now, normally we wouldn't be flying like this, of course, Clive, would we? 
Well, I certainly wouldn't be sitting in this seat, Tony. Go on then, tell them. All right. Well, actually, we're actually down in uh, at Filton British Aerospace and uh, the British Airways flight simulator, which the Concorde crews um, enter the simulator twice a year to do their uh, full training and the revalidation of their licenses. And what you're doing today is one of the flights. And up comes that famous droop snoot. Gosh, and suddenly it goes And it quieter. does go much quieter, isn't it? Yes. It is very much quieter all round. We'll now take you back down to the city and do something that nobody is allowed to do, and, uh, and that is fly down Central Park at about 300 feet <laughs> towards the World Trade Center. I'm going to give a few people a fright. <laughs> towards the Chrysler. Oh, oh. Okay, that's just the rate of descent towards the ground that caused that. You're holding it nice and level now. We're heading for a building between the Chrysler building and the Empire State. In fact, why not go through this one just to show that we can do it. In fact, we're actually going to go between the two towers of the World Trade Center. Or at least we're going to try to. Oh, oh. Okay. Oh. I think you'd better take over now, Tony. All right. The passengers feel that they are in good hands. And so today, we'll just try... Ay, ay, ay. You're turning... It, we're up, upside down. And coming and back up have. again. You can actually roll Concorde quite safely. You could actually roll Concorde quite safely. And, I'd, uh, and it has been done on test flying. It's more than my job was, is worth to do it on a real trip. <laughs> I am speechless. For those pilots who don't fly into New York's World Trade Center, life in the simulator at Filton is a very serious business. Here, the patient Tony Yule has got rid of the amateur in the captain's seat, and with another pilot, Mike Bannister, is himself going through the sort of refresher training required of all Concorde flight crew. Yes, on the, the first of the two details that we do on our refresher, it will involve several uh, rejected takeoffs. One of them will always be done from high speed usually as a result of an engine failure or an engine fire. And so what we're going to do is simulate that, that today. OK, everybody ready? Three, two, one, now. SB building. 100 knots, pass it. One hundred. So Tony is now rejected the takeoff by selecting the uh, engines into reverse and applying the, the brakes, and we're decelerating rapidly on the runway with the aircraft under control. We're now coming to a halt toward the end of the runway. Okay. Fire action number one engine. Fire drill number one engine. Number one engine shutdown handle. It is pulled. Confirmed. Fire has gone out now, so we can ensure that the aircraft's uh, under control and that it's safe. We'd inform air traffic control and taxi clear of the runway before taking any further action. And whilst the pilots do their maintenance work at Filton, the engineers are busy back at Heathrow. In a huge hangar, four Concords. In his element, Boswell. Well, if I sound a little bit nervous, it's because my heart really is beating faster, Clive. Every time I come near one of the Concords, I get that thump, that uh, familiar thump of an old friend being near. I, I'm, I'm becoming emotional already, so I'll stop. With me is Dave McDonnell, who knows much more about the airframe and how it's looked after than any of us. Dave, we're standing by one of them, which is rubbed back to bare metal, ready for a repaint. What else are you doing to her? Well, this is Alpha Bravo. It's the third production airplane, and she came to us uh, about summer 1976. And right now, she's on her first major check. Now, the major check happens every 12,000 hours. And uh, that uh, is a point in itself, uh, in that, although she's 13 years old, we've only flown her for 12,000 hours. Uh, now here, uh, there are a number of areas we're looking at electronically using X-ray and eddy current techniques. And indeed, we take it to such fine detail that we drill out no less uh, than 1,600 rivets purely to X-ray the holes to make sure there's no cracks developing there. A modern aeroplane 
flies much more than uh, a few hours a day in its life. Is, is that why Concorde's going to last longer, because you're not using her very much? Yes, I guess so. I mean, any good long-haul operator ought to be getting about 12 hours a day, daily utilisation, year in, year out, from his aeroplanes. We're presently getting about three hours a day. Now, that's not because we're not doing well. Uh, we're trying to strike a balance between aircraft utilisation that makes us a profit and conservation, because although there are plenty of ideas that about what ought to happen next after Concord, there's still one major imponderable, and that is what to do about the shockwave and the sonic boom, which hasn't been resolved. So, to that end, we're going to make sure that Concord's with us for many years to come. A couple of years ago, you did find something wrong with one of them, or more of them, but you were expecting it. Indeed, on three out of those 1,600 holes on one aircraft, we did find small cracks, about a tenth of an inch long. And I think that what we've proved is that we have the ability and the discipline and the technology to find and isolate these small cracks and repair them whilst they are small. Fatigue in aircraft structures is often talked about. Surely at these higher speeds, higher temperatures that the airframe flies at, isn't it a bigger problem in Concorde than it would be in a jumbo? Well, potentially, because added to the mechanical stresses, we also have the heat, thermal stresses. But it was predicted and it was designed for and our structural inspections, which take place over the annual intermediate check, that's every 1,100 hours, and the big major check that we're standing in front of now, uh, they're searching checks, and they go through the structure zone by zone, looking for any imperfections, and we're very happy with what we find. Uh, the other bugbear of airplanes is corrosion. Now here, uh, we're getting one big benefit back from that temperature, in that any condensation and moisture and spillages because of the skin temperature, it evaporates. And we're really hard pressed to find even the slightest beginnings of any corrosion on this aeroplane, even now 13 years into the game. All games come to an end though, but as far as general manager operations control is concerned, it would seem even half time isn't in sight. Jock Lowe. It was designed in such a way that it, in aeroplane terms it could carry on for 30, 40, 50 years and there's at least another 20 years worth of life within the aeroplane. My own view is that we can carry on flying it until the next supersonic aeroplane comes along. The limitation, if there will be one, will simply be the supply of a, a large number of, of the small parts where the production runs were closed down. But I don't expect that to arrive for at least the next, well, 20 years. I mean, can you imagine a manufacturer being labelled as the, the company which stopped the Concorde flying? So we have a little bit of leverage, I think. How optimistic are you that there's going to be a, a sort of stage two Concorde, if you like, a, a supersonic aircraft to take over from this one? My own view is that the first, uh, the next step will be a smaller aeroplane, 20 to 30 seats, uh, which, is, which flies in parallel with the 747s or the wide-bodied aeroplanes. So the first class load goes off on the supersonic aeroplane. The advantages of that are that well, there's a market there, there's many routes worldwide now which could sustain a smaller aeroplane. There is the technical development in the military fields which can be read across. And of course it doesn't totally disturb the economics of all the major airlines. So my own personal view is that we'll see the small aeroplane. I would like to see um, a positive move uh, get underway uh, quite quickly because obviously a new aircraft of this type is going to take a lot of years to develop, uh, to build and to test fly before it can go into service. One is probably talking about a, a time frame of anything between 10 and 15 years in, in this respect. So the sooner a decision can be taken, uh, the better. Sir Colin Marshall. Of course, there are still those who wish they'd never set eyes on Concord. You have only to be beside the airport perimeter for a takeoff to understand why the eardrums tingle. It's probably the world's noisiest passenger aircraft. Odd, though, how Concorde's fortunes, despite that, have changed from it being likely to be the first and the last of its type with near insurmountable environmental and financial problems, now to being just the forerunner and near universal acceptance. The man who took up the first one from Filton, Brian Trubshaw, would agree with that. Although for him, the silver lining has a cloud. Well, it is a disappointment in a way because when I started in on the program, when I joined it in 1965, there were about 18 airlines who had options. Some of them weren't very serious, but others were, and they gradually fell out 
of the race, mainly because of the high fuel costs, which were unexpected, and secondly because there was a serious doubt made that the aeroplane would get permission to operate into New York. And that did put a few people off. Obviously, it'd been, it would have been better if there had been more aeroplanes aboard. But, but even so, uh, I can't say that I can ever look at it other than as being one of great success. So the fiasco author Andrew Wilson wrote about has become a favourite. But is one of the aircraft's foremost critics now sitting at the other end of the ground with the supporters? If you look at it not just from the aesthetic point of view, but from the engineering point of view, wonderful things went into Concorde. The sadness really is that Concorde has ended up as a kind of uh, um, Orient Express of the air, you might say, taking people on day trips over the Bay of Bissigi and so on. So it's paying its way only in the sense that there is a lot of money floating around in the country for people who are prepared to lay out whatever it is, seven or eight hundred pounds to fly to Cairo for the day, plus a small section of the business community that does need a very fast transit to the United States. That's making it pay, but British Airways never had to pay the price that would have been required for the development of the plane. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello, this is Tony Yule. Well, we're coming to that point now where we're going to be starting the deceleration and the descent. We will cruise in at 37,000 feet at 95% of the speed of sound. And just a point for those of you who haven't flown with us before, after landing to save wear and tear on the brakes, we do use our engine's reverse thrust. And it does make rather an awful noise and can be a little disconcerting if you've not heard it before. But I can assure you it's all normal. Thank you. having been on the line now for just over 18 months. I couldn't think of a better job to do anywhere. A magic aeroplane, she's really wonderful. And the whole thing is really one great big hype. People love flying her, passengers like flying in her, the crews like working on her, and you couldn't wish for a nicer bunch of people to fly with. Can't be a bad life. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello. This is uh, Tony Yule again. Well, we've just landed, and for those of you who collect facts and figures, I have some today. Uh, during the flight, we cruised for a total time of 2 hours and 26 minutes beyond the speed of sound. We achieved a maximum speed of 1,398 miles an hour. And the highest altitude we got to was uh, 58,100 feet just before we started the descent. The time from takeoff to landing was 3 hours and 12 minutes, giving us an average speed of 1,131 miles an hour. Well, we enjoyed flying you, and I hope that wherever you're going, that you'll have a safe and pleasant journey, and we look forward to seeing you one day soon. Bye-bye for now. Yes, I always look up if Concorde's going over. Going Places was presented by Clive Jacobs and produced by Molly Price Owen. And just to bring you down to earth, news of a few problems for road and rail travellers this evening. In Durham, major roadworks at the southern end of the A1M are causing serious congestion on the southbound approach to the Barton Interchange, that's southwest of Darlington. In Warwickshire, an earlier accident on the A47 in Nuneaton is still causing lengthy delays on the Tuttle Hill section. Just north of Oxford, there's severe congestion on the approach to the A34 Pear Tree Roundabout. And if you're heading for the southern half of the M25, be warned that later this evening there's going to be a shift in the roadwork pattern on the Surrey section. This will inevitably cause congestion, and drivers are advised to approach the roadwork stretch near junction 12 of the M25 with extra care. On the railways, London Liverpool Street services are again disrupted this evening. Rail passengers for Cambridge should use the London King's Cross services, and passengers for Harford North should use the King's Cross Harford East section. Also, additional overhead line damage near Leyndon has caused delays and cancellations to Essex destinations, and passengers are advised to use the alternative London Fenchurch Street route. Well, after the news in a moment, we're off to Ambridge for our second visit of the day to the Archers. You're listening to Radio 4.